What I'm going to do is um, take you through um, an agenda which goes you know, broadly like this. First, it's about the history of what's going on, some stuff on mega trends. Um, can business be a force for good? Eventually, I'm going to take you through to what I think is the way forward and some questions that need to be researched by yourselves, at least hopefully so. So firstly, sustainable development and corporate social responsibility. If you go and Google them now and just do the images, this is just a snapshot of the first pages on each of those subjects. And you just go down and down and down and down. And I reflect on 99 when I came back to Australia after many years overseas. Um, people didn't know what corporate social responsibility was. The first talk I gave on the triple bottom line met with blank faces. Australia was in a time war, but I actually believe Australia still is in a time war at this particular moment. Um, so, but now everyone has it. You know, everyone knows what corporate social responsibility is. Everyone knows what sustainability is, don't they? And the images are pretty, and they look pretty good. But if you look at the Business Council of Australia's definition of sustainability, it's about economics and deregulation and you know, more money and you know, the environment's not mentioned. So things have moved on. Why be involved? Zadek, who is uh, a well-known uh, professor who's looked at this, has, has come into sort of four different ideas. And the first one was right, the case for defending reputation. And eventually he sort of goes through, he has those four particular cases. And eventually it sort of becomes much more expansive in thinking about well, this is strategic. What, what's going on in the world? You know, sort of, uh, is business part of the world? Is it part of the economy? Is it part of society? Or is it separate from society? Um, and those debates are you know, genuinely important. And you have some in the business world who think, sort of like the Chicago School of Economics, all you do is make money and trickle-down effects occur. And you have others who go to the other end of the spectrum and say, look, we are part of society. We can be a force for good. There's a lot of academic research now, a, a lot of academic research. But it's then got to express itself in how business acts as it goes forward. And particularly in Australia, I think that becomes important. So, you know, if you go through the history, and it's, it's fascinating, how far is history? Do you go back 20 years? Do you go back 100 years? So, not my business and philanthropy offsets the impact. So I think of Andrew Carnegie building railroads throughout the whole of the United States, you know, cutting down swathes of people, you know, no worries. But then he bought up his foundation and, you know, put Carnegie libraries all around the world. So you do your philanthropy afterwards. And there are many, 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 many philanthropic organizations, many from Europe, many from the United States, who basically say, right, I've created some havoc. I'll pay for it now afterwards. That was history 100 years ago or more. It's changed. But you do get down to, do we go beyond compliance or do we just comply with the law? What do we actually do? There was a period of time, and this graph is from around about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer even, where people were thinking about, are we heading into a period of transformation where we move business into thinking, you know, can we go to zero impact and can we actually contribute to society? Um, and I actually think we are not at the transformation stage yet. We need to be, but we're not there at this particular moment in time. Again, you know, so the discussion sort of in, over the last sort of 10 or 15 years was, Okay, where are my responsibilities? Where is sort of the fence? Am I doing stuff inside the fence? Am I sphere of influence? Am I going outside the fence? Um, you know, what is my geographical scope? Do I actually think about my impact on society or do I just do what I have to do? So people looked at the difficulty and the time and, and so on. And it's, it is tough. It is tough if you decide that you're going to work in a more expansive way. Again, this is a diagram from about probably 10 years ago, I think it is, roughly. Now, I want to move on to something different, something that, you know, that you may look at, the Human Development Index, which comes out of the United Nations. And every, I think it's roughly every three years, they publish a report on the Human Development Index. And in that comes sort of health, education, and living standards. But you could say health, education, and the economy. And those are three perennials which come up in every single of the 200-odd countries in the world. And the UN measures what is the human development index in that country. Basically, what is the pathway of development over time? And indeed, when we think about business, you know, you're actually thinking about you know, the development of your business. But you have to be thinking about it, or you should be thinking about it, in the context of the development of your country or the countries within which you work. And health, education, and the economy come up again and again and again. These three graphs are basically showing from three different points, 
low on the left-hand scale in 1970 through to 2010 of sets of countries that were developing. Now, they're, they're, all, they're not all basket case countries. The ones on the left are fairly basket case countries. Um, and I can't read them from the article over here. But basically, you know, from down here, between 1970 and 2010, Zimbabwe went backwards, Nepal went upwards. The Democratic Republic of the Congo went sort of down and a bit up, but I think it's down again. Oman went up. And Zambia, sort of downish, and Saudi Arabia, upish. And you can see the diagrams for these for the developed countries as well. And the key point, though, is so much of your development pathway depends on governance and this balance between um, the government, business, and civil society. And that just comes out again and again and again. If you want your nation to develop, you've got to get that balance between government, business, and civil society. Get it wrong, you go backwards. Get it right, you go forwards. That applies to Australia as much as it does to anywhere else in the world. <clears throat> if we actually look at what's on the top of voters' minds at the moment from uh, the uh, ABC's uh, vote compass, there are all these issues. You know, what's on the top of your mind? I then sort of colour-coded them into uh, health, education, uh, and um, the environment. There's one... Actually, I don't know if it's one of the environment, but basically, uh, health, education, the economy, and I added security. I put asylum seekers in security. I put in climate change in security. I put food security in security and defence in security. Because again, sort of in, in a sense of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yes, yeah, security is very important to each and every one of us. And in Australia, whilst we generally feel secure, you can be made to feel unsecure or insecure. You really can. Security becomes important. And when those four fundamental things are sitting there all the time, and they are highlighted to you all the time, it's very hard to think about other things. Very, very, very hard to think about other things. And in this particular um, interesting time of our election, um, these things come out again and again and again. <clears throat> so sustainability. Um, John Elkington started up the company called Sustainability and Corporate Social Responsibility. He was the person who coined the phrase triple bottom line. He looks at these three phases, risk and engagement, um, value and collaboration and transformation. And he talks about now the transformation as being more important than ever before and primarily driven by the mega trend of population and everything that then flows from that population growth as we go forward. So let me look at mega trends and uh, alternative worlds. Now mega trends is a very trendy word, very, very trendy word. I think KPMG have mega trends, uh, Bain have mega trends, McKinsey have mega trends. Do you have a megatrend? There's lots of people who have megatrends. Anyway, megatrends is a very, very trendy word. Um, but let me look at it. This is, this is one of my graphs, and I never used to call it a megatrend graph, and I still don't. Uh, but basically, if you're in business looking long-term, and in a company like BP, um, you did look long-term. You looked 50 years. You looked 100 years. And you're scanning the horizon. And of course, everything is unknown. Of course, everything's unknown. And you look at things that are reinforcing of your point of view, and you look at things which are detracting from your point of view, and you change your frames of reference, and you're looking for discontinuities. Discontinuities can kill you, or discontinuities that you can create to create a better market, but you're always looking forward, and you're always trying to scan the horizon to know what is going on or what might happen. And it can be in all sorts of things. So megatrends are particularly important, but not just the crazy megatrend of today. So, Let's have a look at some others in a minute. First, this is the mega trend, the population growth uh, in the world. And I'm not a population freak or anything like that, but I do reflect on from the day I was born to the day I actuarially should die, Tony, um, <laughs> the population will have grown three times of the planet. That's amazing. You know, three times in my lifetime. It's almost there already. You know, not that I'm going to die quickly, but, but, <laughs> but it is a trend which is driving everything. It is driving so many, many things. You know, geopolitically, politically, resource consumption, food consumption, and so on. Really driving many, many things. That is the sort of one mega trend that everyone agrees on pretty much around the world. Now, this is a <coughs> report um, December of last year. Uh, by the National Intelligence Council in America, and it's called Alternative Worlds. And I would encourage you to have a look at it, skim through it, um, read it in detail if you want it. Um, they have some interesting megatrends. So the first one is <coughs> individual empowerment, coming out of the world of communication, democratization that's going on, 
the fact that we can actually all begin to start saying stuff now. You know, you only have to go back 30 or 40 or 50 years. You believe what politicians say. Now politicians have to start listening to us in a little different ways, you know, tweet them or whatever. The diffusion of power is no longer sort of either a bipolar world or a tripolar world. Power is diffusing around the world. Demographic patterns. Some countries are very, very young in their demographies. Some are getting old. Some are getting ancient in their demographies. Those things are changing. And food, water, and the energy nexus, driven very, very, very strongly. So those are the four mega trends that um, this particular report talks about. And if you like, they are, they're almost at a meta level, and they're probably more important than most, I would say. They then talk about some game changes that are going on. And I'm not going to go through these in, in, in detail, but the impact of new technologies. Will technology come in and save us from some of the food, water, energy, climate change crisis, or will it not? Um, the last one there, this is the United States document. What's the role of the United States? Is it going to go become an inward-looking country, or is it going to become an outward-looking country? Don't know. Syria is an interesting test. What will they do? Um, you know, it's, I don't know. I really don't know. But some game changes. And then, as with so many of these things, there's four scenarios there. One is a brilliant scenario, one is a horrible scenario, and there's a couple of other scenarios as well. Again, read them. But this is the most important thing. The future is not set in stone. That's their belief. Um, it is malleable, and the result is interplay between megatrends, game changes, and above all, human agency. What are we going to do? And what they exhort people who read this is plan for the long term. And whether you be government or civil society or business, think about what are the things you can do to bias the outcomes uh, to the positive and neutralize the outcomes to the negative. <coughs> so this is a graph from BP in 2000. Um, and what we were looking at was there are good business environments, environments in which businesses flourish. And there are bad business environments, environments in which businesses do crap business, unless you happen to be in the arms trade, perhaps. You know? um, and then we were asking ourselves, what were the vectors of what we did? Did we bias towards the positive business environment, or did we bias towards the negative business environment? We thought of ourselves not as a development agency, but certainly as an agent in development. And I do mean development in the larger concept of can we develop our nations as we go forward and what is our contribution to that and, and how do we think about it? Is it just reputation? Is it genuine contribution? Is it eliminating negatives? So my own beliefs are very much that any business, big or small, should have this sort of frame in its mind. Um, it doesn't have to have the, the global frame. You can be a small company who the founder is a member of Rotary trying to do what he can do or she can do in their local community, biasing towards the positive and eliminating the negative. And that's on the environmental front, the social front, and the economic front. And it's a genuine activity. So can business be a force for good? I certainly believe it can. And again, sort of this is sort of triple bottom line. Um, who talks about the triple bottom line today? Well, not many people. People basically do financial reporting. They do environmental reporting and some do social reporting. It tends to come forward. And you've got to deliver today and tomorrow and the day after and forever and ever. And if you want to become biblical, you say amen. And if and only if you deliver, come what may, so that's a global financial crisis graph in the middle, and you survive, only if you're a business that is doing a profitable return over time and can keep going do you ever actually get invited through the door to think about, can you shape tomorrow? So business's first purpose has to be to survive. It does have to be survive and to thrive. But it's also going to be thinking about where is its horizon? So the question for me of business is, what is your time horizon? Is it the quarterly or annual report? Is it the political cycle? Is it decades ahead? And you can see companies who look decades ahead because they necessarily have to. And you can look at companies who are looking at the quarterly annual report and what's the market going to do because they're in survival mode. Or you can see them doing that because they're interested only in the dollars, not the other bits and pieces. What is your geographical horizon? You know, do you actually think about the world? Or is it just Australia Inc? Or Canberra? Or a city near you? 
what is it? You know, your geographical horizon dictates a lot about how you think and what you can do. And it, again, it doesn't matter if you're a small company in a small town in a part of Australia. You can work out what your time horizon is, and you can work out what your ge geographical horizon is. I believe you can actually work out where you can make your contributions. So you then have to work out um, you know, where can you contribute. And I, and I unashamedly choose the colours here, sort of you know, blue for sort of the blue liberal democratic economy way of thinking, pink for the pinkos, the socialists, and green for the greenos. And, and basically, if you're in business, you come to sustainable development thinking about these dimensions, but you come through it with a language and a frame of mind that comes from economics and finance. So you always say, why am I bloody spending this money on this environmental crap? Where's the return? You know, why am I bloody pink house? You know, why would I be working with them? You know? Now, that's a unipolar view of the world. I actually do believe, and we'll come to it in a minute, that others have unipolar views of the world. But different, different businesses can contribute in the different dimensions. And again, in BP, we used to say that you know, BP could intellectually contribute to the health and community debate, but logically, it's not the right place. And you could contribute to the depletion of fish stock debate, but it's not the logical place. But you can contribute to institutional strengthening in developing nations, and that's BP actually did, and also uh, inner city pollution, climate change. So you've got to pick the areas that you can logically contribute. And this is where I used to tease my social and environmental colleagues were, are they really interested in sustainable development or are they only interested in the societal issue or just the environmental issue? Because if you are unipolar, then what happens is you get a dialogue, a dialogue of the deaf in the middle. No one is speaking. You have to put on the ears of the other people and the eyes and spectacles of the other people and learn the different languages in order to contribute to the thinking of sustainable development as we go forward. And we see so much unipolar language that comes out of different folk. <coughs> so business leadership, <coughs> it isn't easy. So what I did here was you can see the diagram in the middle which goes back to Leonardo da Vinci, you know, so the man, the Indian <coughs> man who in this particular case fits perfectly into a propeller. And you're torn apart. If you are the leader of an organization, be you the chief executive or the chair or a director on a board, who am I speaking? Well, you know, I know what I am, but who am I speaking for? Am I speaking for my company? Am I speaking within my sector? And do I speak for my colleagues who I might be friends with or might not be friends with? Oh, and by the way, I happen to be in the industry association as well, and I happen to be an officer of that association. Do I speak for them? But I'm a person. You know, man or woman, I'm a person. I've got a family and I've got values and beliefs. I'm a citizen. Who am I? And that becomes really, really, really important. Because very often, as a CEO or a chair, you are told you cannot speak on this. You do not have a right to speak on this because you can only speak with the shareholder in mind and no one else. You do not have a right to speak as an Australian or as a parent. The person who is in those roles is torn, really, really torn between their responsibilities as the business person, the sector person, or the individual. And it really is a, uh, a visceral tearing. So who am I and what am I again? You know, in Australia, the tall poppy syndrome is a cultural problem that we actually have in a way that many others don't have. You know, it, it occurs in other countries, of course it does. In fact, tall poppies, if you actually go back into history, goes back around about 2,000 to 3,000 years in terms of history, the discussion on tall poppies. But we have it here in Australia in spades. And Peter Harcher talks about it. You know, no Australian is permitted to assume that he or she is better than any other Australian. In other words, you can't speak out. You know, don't speak out ahead of your peers. Your peers will pull you down, and they do really rather quickly. Um, and by prompt and corrective of levelling derision, um, you know, tall poppy syndrome is there. It's very, very hard for CEOs and chairs to speak out in this country. More so, I believe, than in America and in Europe and in some of the other parts of the world. And that makes it tough. And that's actually I think it's a research question as to how can one help uh, CEOs, chairs, understand who they are and what they are and the difference between that. <coughs> so within BP, there were a, a, a number of leadership competencies. And one was called the, the courage to lead. And you had to, yes, you had to have earned the respect over time for what you were doing. You had to have 
you, you do have to act wisely and decisively and you have to think logically where you, you actually do speak. And you are trying to impact things. You've got to work out where they are. But the fact that it, within a company like BP you recognise it takes courage to lead. It is bloody difficult. And I don't at all um, belittle the efforts that some of the people who are CEOs and chairs today have in, in their efforts to try and speak out. It's very, very, very difficult. Who speaks matters. You know, is it the monkey or the organ grinder? Oh, sorry, the business association or the organ grinder. I'm not sure which. Um, I actually believe if you're going to speak out, you have to speak out as your company. You can't hide behind the shield of the business association says this. It always is the lowest common denominator. And within the Australian dialogue, business associations speak more than CEOs and chairs speak. That is a big problem, and we have to find a way around that. <clears throat> so sensible development and corporate social responsibility. So I, I think of it like this, in terms of there are economic actors, and if they think that they can just do everything they like just to earn a dollar, and everything else is an externality, automatically you stimulate the social and environmental actors to come back and refute that and push back against it. And it becomes one of those very, very hard, nasty dialogues. So, in the end, sensible development, whatever the development activity is, whether it be you know, building another coal terminal or coal seam gas stuff, or you know, it could be something small and local, you've got to be thinking about <coughs> what is the environmental enhancement I'm going to be doing around this development activity? What is the social enhancement I'm going to be making? And that might be time variable. It might be a distraction at the beginning and it might be four positive at the end. Because temporal dimensions and spatial dimensions really matter in this. And what is the economic benefit that's going on? And you have to think about being positive in each of those three dimensions as you go forward. But I do believe that progressive corporates and other actors who work together to achieve that goal can actually um, speak out as long as they have the space in which to speak and the place in which to stand and then the courage to speak out. So the research questions. Um, so which are the areas upon which business should speak? And, I, and I'm now thinking again at the if you like, meta level for Australia, what are the areas that you would like to see businesses speak out about? Of course, there's many businesses, but what are the main areas? Four or five. And how do you disentangle this long-term good from the short-term gain and reconcile it with stakeholders? You know, particularly, particularly the shareholders' associations and so on. That. that becomes very, very important. You know, sharehold, the shareholders association have got to understand that there is a short term and there's a long term. And unless you create a positively biased of vectors towards a good business environment, you actually will end up with a worse business environment. Um, how do you set up the contribution to continue through the cycles of business and the cycles of boards and the cycles of CEOs? Some CEOs leave, some are left, some time expire, some change. And sometimes the beliefs and values of that organization wither on the vine, or do they? Probably not. They're probably still embodied with the organization. But how do you set it up within organizations that things that they're trying to do in a progressive way stay through those business cycles, both the exogenous business cycles and the internal ones? <coughs> how do you better prepare the chair and CEO for the rocky road ahead? You know, how many Chairs and CEOs come to universities for schooling. You know, they know everything, don't they? You know, they're meant to, anyway. But how do they get schooled in speaking in public when you've got some of the actors, both left, right, and middle of politics, you know, shouting them down? How do you prepare them for that? You know, we do crisis management on all sorts of stuff, but this is a different type of different type of issue. How do you prepare people for that? <coughs> and how do you make it safe, or at least safer? Uh, in the face of resistance in a tall poppy world. And I do believe this in our, in our Australian culture, that becomes a really, really big issue. And it's an Australian issue, I think, more than anything else. So those are your questions. And um, 3,000 words and three weeks, please. <laughs> Thank you very much.